Thank you to the organizing committee for inviting me to give this talk today. And usually the colorectal talks are at the very end of the program. So I'm grateful that today we're not at the very end of the program. So uh, I'm here to talk about uh, some minimally invasive management of colorectal cancer, uh, a nice follow-up to the previous talks. I'm going to review the surgical principles uh, for colorectal cancer and, spe uh, and specifically focus on the minimally invasive surgery options, uh, those that are current and developing in practice. Uh, but it's not just a surgery talk. Uh, we're going to also talk about uh, some evolving concepts in the adjuvant and neoadjuvant uh, therapies for particularly for rectal cancer, as well as non-operative management of uh, rectal cancer. Uh, historically, uh, you know, even though we're surgeons, we actually do think about not doing surgery for everyone. Um, and uh, many of the uh, leaders in uh, 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 new modalities to avoid surgery have been surgeons historically. So in colon cancer, the principle is to remove the anatomic segment of the colon or rectum uh, containing the cancer, uh, as well as uh, intact mesentery, which contains the lymph nodes, which is important for staging and further treatment. The, uh, in, 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 in colon cancer, uh, a permanent colostomy is rarely required. Uh, the scenarios in which uh, colostomies are required are in cancers involving the anal sphincter or in patients who uh, have baseline fecal incontinence uh, for, uh, uh, in, in, uh, with rectal cancer. Uh, so that's you know, the, the most common question that we get from, from patients usually is this very question, and, uh, and then there's, that's the answer. Temporary ileostomies are commonly needed uh, in rectal cancer surgery, uh, and the criteria for uh, needing them uh, is as stated here. Uh, it, it does serve as a bridge uh, for sphincter preservation, and, and typically uh, most of us will perform prophylactic diverting ileostomies for patients who have been treated with radiation or those who we are going to perform anastomosis at five centimeters from the anus. So this diagram demonstrates how the resection of the colon uh, is, is uh, 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 determined based on where the tumor is located. And so therefore, uh, knowing and understanding where the, the lesion is located is critical in terms of the defining your, your boundaries of your resection. Uh, and as a public service announcement uh, for, uh, for surgeons, uh, when it comes to placing your tattoos, uh, please place the tattoo just distal to the tumor. Um, oftentimes, doing the proximal, distal, uh, around and around, it just doesn't, doesn't help and actually creates quite a mess when we're trying to do surgery. And then also, for rectal tumors, for mid and distal rectal cancers, uh, tattooing and turning the entire rectum black uh, does not help us either during surgery. So I would try to minimize uh, doing the tattoos for more distal rectal cancers. Most uh, of the colon cancer resections, as well as rectal cancer resections, can be done in a minimally invasive fashion. This can be laparoscopic uh, uh, or uh, robotic approaches. These approaches do require uh, a certain level of skill, uh, but the benefits include things like less pain, quicker return to activities uh, uh, on a daily basis, improved cosmesis, as well as from a systems perspective, the shorter uh, length of hospital stay. But are cancer outcomes uh, equivalent to open surgery uh, when you are comparing them to laparoscopic versus uh, or uh, open? There are uh, a number of prospective randomized trials uh, with comparing laparoscopic versus open colon cancer surgery. Uh, these uh, have been uh, pretty well defined in terms of the equivalency of open versus laparoscopic uh, surgery when it comes to colon cancer. Uh, and, and most of these trials essentially uh, you know, equate uh, the, the oncologic outcomes. And what they do show uh, is that there's a shorter length of stay generally with laparoscopic approach. Uh, and no real differences in major complications, uh, but laparoscopic or generally minimally invasive surgery does take longer in terms of uh, time spent in the operating room. The trials comparing laparoscopic versus open rectal cancer surgery 
have been more difficult uh, to, uh, to clarify, uh, but there are a number of them, a couple of them showed potentially higher rates of uh, circumferential or section margins, uh, but overall, uh, the conclusion with meta-analyses of a lot of these trials has concluded once again that laparoscopic versus open rectal cancer surgery are uh, <coughs> equivalent. So the cancer outcomes are equivalent, but the reality is that you know only about half of colon cancer operations in the country are done in a minimally invasive fashion, and even much less so for rectal cancer surgery. And this is because these operations uh, with this approach can be technically challenging, uh, and in particular uh, related to disease complexity, anatomy, and, and, and with our um, obesity epidemic, uh, you know, it just makes things very difficult. When they are performed uh, laparoscopically, they are generally performed with what we call an extracorporeal anastomosis. So the uh, surgery is perform performed for the most part on the inside, but then the bowel and specimen are exteriorized out of the body and resected and anastomoses are created outside of the body uh, and then return uh, to the inside. Uh, there is growing literature suggesting that if you perform everything on the inside, uh, including the anastomosis, that there may, uh, there may be uh, short-term outcome advantages. Uh, but this is technically, again, difficult to adopt in a straight laparoscopic uh, fashion routinely, again, oftentimes because of our uh, obesity factors that we have to deal with. And so in this video, this is, a, this is an old video of mine um, of a laparoscopic uh, approach for a right hemicolectomy, and, um, uh, and we're uh, mobilizing the, the colon. Uh, this is the iliocolic uh, vessel uh, where the mesentery is. The duodenum is on the on the right side uh, up here, and so we do this the surgery in this fashion. Let me see if I'm going to need to. What's this? It's not coming up. Okay, my little advancement thing is not showing up here, so. But essentially, the colon is mobilized and then exteriorized out of the body. I'm not going to be able to show you that because I can't find the little cursor here. Um, and so we'll move on. But what's challenge, uh, what, what often can be useful in uh, overcoming these barriers uh, of conventional laparoscopy is robotics, uh, something that uh, we've adopted in recent, recent years and the technical advantages uh, that it provides uh, can allow a wider adoption of minimally invasive surgery. So once again, I'm not gonna be able to fast forward through this, but this is how that's done. And so typically these are, these are the results of these small incisions and one of the advantages of doing a completely intracorporeal uh, anastomosis, meaning the entire connection on the inside, is you have a free-floating specimen and you can take it out of anywhere that you want on the abdominal wall uh, and you're not restricted to being attached on the inside. Here's a, a, a video of a, a sigmoid colectomy, which again, unfortunately, cannot sift through. There's not the, it's just not coming up. It's more than this. So here's a, Tattoo, for example, that's a distal tattoo you can see in the distance. But you can also see some tattoo on the pelvic sidewall here.
So I'll move forward, but essentially what you uh, end up doing is um, mobilize and divide and, and we do a, uh, an anastomosis on the inside. And with that approach, once again, uh, we can exteriorize or, or uh, extract the specimen through any incision that we want. So this, this uh, uh, left upper quadrant incision and this very large uh, patient uh, is where we were able to take the sigmoid colon specimen out of um, uh, because that is where the thinnest part of the body uh, can, can be. Uh, and in the right picture here, uh, you know, this is a patient who'd had a prior bariatric operation and gastrectomy, uh, and, and we were able to um, uh, do, still do this operation uh, in a minimally invasive fashion, and both patients went home on the second postoperative day. With all of this, uh, uh, these uh, uh, approaches and minimally basic surgery, you can see that what we've taken is an operation that typically when I first started out as a faculty member, most of my patients were in the hospital for five, six days to now we are, for the most part, getting these patients out of the hospital in one or two days. Um, and, and it's nearing a point where, you know, surgery is not, you know, the horrible uh, thing that, uh, 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 that, that, that we used to think about um, and, and pushing it to becoming a, uh, an almost outpatient uh, operation. With rectal cancer, it gets more complicated uh, because it's important to appreciate that colon cancer are, is not the same thing as rectal cancer. Uh, and the reason is because of the propensity of local recurrence. Um, uh, and, and another, I suppose, uh, a public service uh, announcement in the GI community is that uh, the rectal MRI has, for the most part, uh, uh, become the favored modality for uh, rectal cancer staging uh, evaluation. However, um, endorectal ultrasound is still uh, a critical tool and that's complementary to it. And, and the reason is because uh, EUS is better at deciphering for us the very more early tumors. So deciphering T1 versus T2, whereas the MRIs can tend to overcall those, but the MRI has the advantage of giving us better boundaries when it comes to the mesorectal fascial involvement as well as lymph nodes. And with rectal cancer, there are, there are more options in treatment. Chemo, chemo radiation is involved, um, and um, uh, uh, local excision is an option, and non-operative management is an option. But what is the standard for uh, rectal cancer? It's what we call total mesorectal excision uh, approach, or TME. And the, uh, the essential parts of it is that what you have to do is, uh, for a rectal resection, uh, stay within the uh, proper planes to include the mesorectal envelope uh, in your specimen. What we uh, strive for is always a two centimeter distal margin uh, and, uh, and, and, but one centimeter is generally acceptable in the, pre in the setting of preoperative uh, chemo radiation and when uh, it's the only way to do sphincter preservation. So the standard for the past 20 years or so based on the German rectal cancer trial is that patients who have a stage two or stage three uh, rectal cancer, whether by EUS or, uh, or MRI, are treated with what's called long course chemo radiation uh, along with a radio sensitizing uh, chemotherapy. Patient subsequently undergoes total mesorectal excision, usually with a diverting ileostomy, and then what, we, what is taken out is, is evaluated uh, by surgical pathology, and the results of that will then determine the role for adjuvant uh, chemotherapy. And after completing adjuvant chemotherapy, the patient returns for a, a second stage operation with an ileostomy reversal. And so with, with these uh, uh, low anterior resections or TME uh, approaches, uh, with sphincter preservation, again, we're able to do these operations with small incisions where the ileostomy site is the largest uh, one that they have. Are there alternatives to total mesorectal excision for rectal cancer? Uh, and even though TME is, is the best chance for cure, it is not uh, a benign operation. Uh, 
Uh, there are uh, uh, lifelong potential implications for uh, functional outcomes uh, for these patients. And over the past you know, 20, 25 years, as the institution of uh, uh, new adjuvant chemo radiation took place with uh, for rectal cancer, the observation was that there was a subset of uh, patients who would achieve after we do the surgery to remove uh, uh, the organ that they would have achieved a complete pathologic response. In other words, no remaining tumor uh, visible. And so in the early 2000s, the interest uh, uh, developed in the idea of in these subset of patients, is it possible to avoid surgery altogether? Uh, and this was championed by a colorectal surgeon in Brazil um, who uh, uh, started publishing uh, their experience with uh, complete pathologic response and complete clinical response of rectal cancers with chemotherapy and radiation alone, and they would then monitor these patients uh, as opposed to proceeding with surgery as is routine. Over the, over the years, uh, a number of uh, uh, series have accumulated, but with wide, wide ranges of, of uh, complete response rates. Uh, and international databases were, were put together. And essentially, what it shows is that of the patients who develop a complete clinical response, 25% will have a regrowth of the tumor at around two years. But as the years go by, if they don't have a recurrence, they could really be potentially cured with chemotherapy and radiation alone. And in those patients who recur, majority of them are salvaged subsequently with, with surgery. But this type of an approach is not easy. Um, uh, it requires an intensive uh, surveillance uh, of these patients uh, if, if they choose to pursue this route. So in this uh, uh, photograph here, you can see the book the initial diagnostic uh, uh, photo of the rectal cancer that's quite low, uh, and after chemo radiation, hardly anything there. It's all, all that's left is a faint white scar. This is a complete kind of response, and this is the type of patient where you could discuss the option of non-operative management. This is a patient of mine who's now over three years out. On the other hand, you know, this is a, uh, this is a patient, uh, again, on the, on the left, the pre-treatment uh, uh, appearance on the colonoscopy, and then on the right, after chemotherapy and radiation. That is clearly not a complete response. This one is a bit more borderline, uh, but again, uh, this is still not a complete clinical response because it still has kind of a lumpy, bumpy look to it. Uh, and so this patient would proceed with, uh, with surgery. So what can be done to potentially improve the distant metastatic disease? We, we have a good plan uh, and, and good standards for, uh, for uh, achieving local control. Uh, what can be done further? And in recent years, this concept of a total ne neoadjuvant therapy came about for rectal cancer. And the possible benefits include things like being able to deliver uh, chemotherapy in a, uh, in a more reliable fashion uh, uh, rather than postoperatively in case there are surgical complications, for instance, earlier introduction of systemic therapy for micrometastatic disease, and potentially achieving the complete clinical response that then allows patients to avoid surgery altogether. And then finally, from a technical perspective, usually if a patient is going to have uh, adjuvant chemotherapy after the surgery, if they have an ileostomy, they will need to complete that prior to their ileostomy reversal. And if they've already had all of their chemotherapy up front, they could potentially have their ileostomy reversed sooner. And so a number of uh, landmark trials uh, came about in the last couple of years, actually. Uh, the OPTRA trial, the Prodige 23 trial, as well as the Rapido uh, trial, as listed here. This is a busy slide, but, but basically what it showed was with the OPTRA trial, uh, patients with rectal cancer underwent chemotherapy and radiation uh, with, chemo, uh, with radiation initially, followed by chemotherapy, and then compared to chemotherapy followed by uh, radiation. And uh, the outcomes were such that at three years, 53% of patients had achieved a complete clinical response and did not have surgery. 
uh, compared to 41% for patients who had had chemotherapy followed by radiation. The Pradesh 23 trial uh, demonstrated that the option of fulfirinox, a more intensive uh, chemotherapy, could reduce, uh, 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 excuse me, can increase the pathologic complete response rate. These are patients who had all of this treatment and then still had surgery, and so we had surgical pathology uh, evaluation. And finally, the, the Rapido trial uh, introduced uh, uh, the short course radiation, which is of five days of radiation as opposed to the traditional 28 days of radiation. Uh, uh, into the mix, uh, which is something that had been practiced in Europe for a number of years, but uh, slower to adopt in the, in the U.S. But now here at UCLA, we're, we're actually using this approach uh, quite a bit. And what it demonstrated was a pathologic complete response rate of 28% uh, in, uh, compared to 14% uh, in the traditional scheme. And so with these trials, uh, uh, the uh, chemo, what it demonstrated was the OPRA trial demonstrated chemo radiation, uh, chem, excuse me, radiation before chemotherapy increases complete clinical response rate. The fulfirinox is an option as well to increase pathologic complete response rate. And then short course radiation therapy can be an alternative to long course uh, radiation therapy and increases uh, pathologic complete response rate. Is there a role for local excision for rectal cancer? Um, you know, there is very selectively. Uh, Dr. Kim uh, mentioned uh, that a little bit, uh, but essentially it's for T1s uh, of a certain type. Uh, if, you're, if it's a well-differentiated T1 cancer without lymphovascular invasion, uh, and, uh, then, then that is, that those are options. How do we do that? Um, we approach it uh, usually in a transanal uh, fashion. Uh, you can see in the right picture here, that's, that's a T1 uh, cancer. Uh, we, we perform a circumferential uh, excision of the tumor site and take it all the way down to the mesorectal fat. So uh, it's not a mucosal resection, it's a full thickness uh, rectal resection. Uh, we want to do this in one piece. Uh, we, we don't, we don't uh, uh, subscribe to piecemeal resections. Uh, and then reconstruct uh, the, uh, uh, the defect. Now, typically these are done as outpatient surgeries uh, for us, usually under an hour. And there are a variety of uh, approaches of doing this for patients where we cannot reach it directly through the anus. Uh, if they are uh, you know, seven, eight, uh, nine, 10 centimeters above the, uh, the anal level, uh, then, uh, then there are uh, uh, approaches to reach that area. But, you know, there is some cautionary uh, uh, factors uh, with doing this because a local excision, no matter which way you look at it, is technically, from an oncologic perspective, inferior to total mesorectal excision. And so it's an important discussion that you have with the patient in terms of what kind of risk tolerance, what recurrences they, they, they can accept. This is in your syllabus, uh, but we will not go over that. But essentially, in summary, uh, there's been significant progress uh, in multimodality therapy, uh, a lot of different uh, surgical techniques and advances with minimally invasive surgery. Uh, and you know, I do think that uh, uh, one of the uh, advantages that we have uh, here is the multidisciplinary uh, approach. Uh, I think that that is the um, optimal uh, way to figure these out. And this is our, our team. This is a older picture. I look much older. The only person that doesn't look any older in this picture is Stephen Kim.